I'll begin with a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman, having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it? And when she hath found it, she called her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels, of the angels of God, over one sinner that repenteth. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to hear and receive from you your good word, your assurance of peace and salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is declared to us and proclaimed to us in our readings from this morning. In the reading from 1 Peter, Peter's first letter, chapter 3, Peter writes, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ died once, he suffered once for sin, him, the just, the righteous, for us, the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That is the good news of the gospel. And in this sentence, in our reading just now from Luke chapter 15, from from our gospel lesson, Jesus is speaking to the sinners and the tax collectors who have gathered to hear what he has to say. They've been drawn to hear what he has to say. And the Pharisees and the scribes are critical of this. But by being critical and in their words of criticism or complaints, they inadvertently declare the good news of the gospel. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Indeed, that is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news that we come to hear. You see, the the tax collectors and the Pharisees, those who were outcast, marginalized, looked down upon for, for many reasons, had begun to hear what Jesus had to say. They'd begun to hear Jesus's words of teaching. When he said that there was a narrow gate and he encouraged his hearers to enter through the narrow gate because it would be difficult to enter through this narrow gate. There were those who felt entitled that of course they would enter the narrow gate. They were the few, they were the elite, they were the teachers, they were the educated, they were the leaders. Of course they would enter into this narrow gate, they assumed. And when they come to enter this narrow gate in a parable that Jesus told, he said, no, I, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. And they, and they responded by saying, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. 
We were the people that you know. You are, you are the one that we know. Come on. Of course we're the ones to come in this narrow gate. I mean, who else would come in the narrow gate than, than us, the educated, the elite, the leaders, the ones who understand God and know the scriptures. We're the ones that would come in, right? And that is when, uh, in the parable, the one who has closed the gate says, depart from me, I never knew you. And so the sinners and the tax collectors would have to have heard this message as, now wait a minute. If they all, the entitled, the assumed, don't necessarily get in through this narrow gate, which in this parable is is the way into the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, then who does get in the narrow gate? Hmm, the possibility lies open. And then Jesus tells another parable. This is just preceding what we heard read in Luke 15 and in Luke chapter 14. He says, when you have a feast or when you are invited to a feast and you go to a feast, don't assume that you should take the place of high honor. Instead, take the lowest place in humility that if you are meant to be in the place of high honor, you will be invited to a higher seat uh, in the, among the guests. But uh, don't assume that. So the sinners and the tax collectors would have heard that. Hmm. So the high, the elite, those who uh, assume that they have this place of honor, maybe they don't. Well, then who, who does have this place of honor? And then the, this great uh, parable just before Jesus uh, says what he said in Luke chapter 15 says, and uh, at the great banquet, uh, everyone, people are invited to this great banquet and, and people come uh, and those who have been invited come with excuses and they come with excuses to the one throwing the banquet and they say, you know, I, I'm, I have a, a new home or I have some new oxen I need to to, to, to work with and, or I'm getting married. I have other things to do. I'm, I, I can't come to your great banquet. And, and the banquet master in this parable is upset and he says to his, uh, his servants, he says, go out and get the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. Bring those outcasts, bring those who are considered cursed by our culture and people because of their situation, bring them into the banquet. So these sinners and tax collectors would have heard this parable of Jesus hearing, what is he saying? Those who all of us have assumed would be in the narrow gate, who would be at the great banquet, who would be at the feast are not the ones who have the seats of honor, are not those who are included uh, to, to, to fill the ranks of those who are enjoying the great banquet. Let's hear more closely what Jesus has to say. So of course they were drawing near to him. And that's when the Pharisees and the scribes say, look, he's, he's, he's eating with the, the sinners. He's, he's spending time with them. How can that be? So then we have Jesus telling three parables in Luke chapter 15, three parables, three familiar parables, and they are about the misery of being lost and the joy of finding what was lost. The misery of being lost and the joy of finding that which was lost. So he tells these three parables. He tells the parable of, of the lost sheep who got lost by straying away from the rest of the flock and out of the shepherd's eye, straying away from presumably one clump of grass to another and finding himself far away from the shepherd, lost out of the shepherd's sight. And when the shepherd realizes that he has uh, lost one sheep, he leaves the 99 in safety and he goes to find the one who has wandered astray until he finds it and he brings it back rejoicing. And then there's the parable of the coin the coin that was lost by the woman. And the, the woman who has realized that she lost the coin and she brings a light and a broom and sweeps up until she finds the coin and she celebrates and rejoices with her friends uh, that, that the coin has been found. 
And in both of these cases, Jesus says, you know, when the lost has been found, there's great rejoicing, just like there's great rejoicing in heaven when one who has wandered astray or one who has been lost uh, repents and returns and comes back. And that leads to the third parable, which wasn't read just now, but the third parable of the lost son. And the lost son is not like the sheep who wandered astray accidentally and found himself lost, or like the coin that is lifeless and inanimate and entirely helpless to find itself. Um, the son has rejected the father, has rejected God in this, in this parable, and he intentionally separates himself from his father, and he goes and takes his portion of his inheritance and, and uh, enjoys uh, life in the big, city, the big city, presumably, until he comes to his sen senses and realizes what he's done, realizes his own separation from his father's love, uh, realizing how he is not able to even provide for himself, and he comes back. And in this parable, the father is not one who went to find the son or brings light to sweep, but has waited patiently for the son to return. And when the son does return, he has a huge celebration. Now in this, what is Jesus saying, not just to the scribes and Pharisees who are criticizing him, but to the sinners and tax collectors who've come within earshot to hear what Jesus has to say? What is he saying to them? And what is he saying to all of us? Well, there are many ways to be lost, Jesus says. There are many ways to be lost. You could be lost like the sheep is lost. And the sheep is lost by inadvertently straying and getting so far away that he has no way back. And all he might do is you know, bleat out uh, so that he might be found by his voice. But he is found by the one who has come seeking to find him. And the coin. Some of us are lost like the coin is lost. The coin is lost and lifeless and entirely incapable and helpless of doing anything. They can't even bleat out to be heard. Uh, they are entirely at uh, the discretion of the one who uh, would find uh, the coin. And uh, the woman who brings the light so that light can be seen, so that dust can be removed, so that the coin can be found. And the son, of course, the son is one who has intentionally separated himself from God's love in his own foolishness uh, to find something else as though something else will be as good or better or in any way a substitute for the love of the Father. And so in this, Jesus teaches us not about the different ways to be lost, but he actually teaches us about the three persons of the Trinity, the many ways that God works in finding the lost. In the parable of the sheep, uh, God the Son is the one who came incarnate into the world to seek out, to speak of the kingdom of God, to have a meal with the sinners and tax collectors, to reach out to those who feel that they have been rejected and marginalized, uh, who are undeserving, who have wandered astray, who, who by default have sought other things to fill uh, what God had intended for him to fill in their lives. So God the Son has come to pursue them. And of this inanimate, lifeless coin that is lost, uh, it, is, it is God the Spirit that works in the situation to bring light so that, so that the coin might be seen, that pushes away the dust and the dirt so that the coin may be found by the one seeking. This is uh, alluding to the Holy Spirit who works in ways that sometimes we don't understand, not directly or specifically found and grabbed onto by the Son who would come to find us, but the Spirit works in ways that uncovers or illuminates or brings to light things that would draw us to be found, to see, to know uh, the one whose love for us is greater than we can imagine. And of course, in the parable of the lost son, we see depicted uh, in this parable the father who waits patiently, patiently for the son. So there are many ways to be lost. There are many ways to describe the father's love and the love of God, father, son, 
and Holy Ghost to find the people or to bring the people or to draw the people to himself. This conversation with the sinners and the tax collectors is in itself a parable of God uh, working among the people. So even though we are the lost and God is the one who seeks or lumens or waits patiently for us, all of these parables, all of these, the message that we hear through Luke chapter 15 in these parables, the message to the Pharisees and the scribes, and the message to those who realize that they are the sinners, the lost, is that it is God who finds, and it is he who rejoices when we are found and brought back to him. And those who are lost are in misery that, in that we are separated from the one who cares for and loves us. So again, these parables are about the misery of being lost and the joy, God's joy, in finding us, those who have been lost. This is not about our joy in finding our way back. This is not about our joy in finally being back in relationship or in a relationship with God. This is about God's joy in finding us, whether we've gone astray unintentionally, whether we just don't know where we are and find ourselves wandering or searching or un uncertain about what this all means, this life that we are a part of, or whether we've intentionally turned our back on God and, and only now realize that he has been patiently waiting for us to turn and receive him. He rejoices. He rejoices. So even though we are in a time of pandemic and sickness, even though there is social unrest uh, in places in our nation, in our, in our world, and in our lives. Our worshiping together, whether it be online or in person, our worshiping together is not so much about our joy, it's not so much about our excitement about coming to God, it's about God's excitement and joy about having found us. And here we are, those sinners, those tax collectors, those poor, uh, those um, sick, those needing to be found, those crippled, lame, and blind. Here we are. He is rejoicing over us. Therefore, we celebrate because of his joy and celebration over us. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news to us. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Amen.